Hi there, everyone, and welcome to The Daily Gardener, and thank you for listening. I'm your host, Jennifer Ebling. It's April 20th. Today we celebrate the French botanist and explorer who christened the begonia, the magnolia, and the fuchsia. We'll also learn about one of the best and earliest botanical collectors and artists in Holland. And she was a woman to boot. We'll celebrate the American naturalist who was born into one of our country's botanical founding families. And we'll also honor the life of one of America's greatest garden writers, Louise B.B. Wilder. We'll also honor the life of a Spanish artist who equated his work as a painter and sculptor to that of a gardener. We grow that garden library with a book about gardening in your front yard. It's packed with ideas and projects for big and small spaces. And this idea of gardening in your front yard is gaining popularity and acceptance thanks to stay-at-home orders and physical distancing. It's one of the few positive side effects of dealing with the pandemic. And then today, we'll wrap things up with a delightful dessert that continues to impress and that is having its special day today. And we've been making and enjoying this dessert in America for well over a hundred years now. But first, let's catch up on some greetings from gardeners around the world in today's curated news. Listener Jane Elliott wrote in to share pictures of her huge front garden. And the thing she's most looking forward to this spring is her enormous purple lilac. And right now I'm seeing lots of photos of beautiful lilacs coming into bloom, as well as for Scythia with its beautiful golden flowers. They really brighten up the neighborhood. And Julie Brown wrote in to share her to-do list over the weekend, which included plenty of weeding, It said, weeding, 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 adding compost to her containers to get them ready for spring, tidying up the yard, and weeding, weeding, weeding. That was cute. And then finally, Al Mirian shared a picture of his miniature iris. They're cute and adorable. He's growing the variety called Cherry Garden, and they're in bloom right now. And I like the little iris, especially when they're growing in a tulip bed, because if you're planting shorter tulips, the heights are similar. And it's a nice mix to see that iris bloom next to a tulip blossom. Very pretty combination. Now, if you've never grown miniature iris, one of the best places to source them is from a neighbor or gardener in your neighborhood that is already growing them. They need to be divided regularly anyway, but they are a very cute addition to any garden. Miniature iris. Check them out. Then finally, if you happen to follow Alistair Griffiths on Twitter, you can find him at Botany Rocks. He asked a question recently that I thought was a good one. He asked, what three plants in your garden have made a positive impact on your well-being during lockdown? What a great question. Anyway, the responses were very, very inspiring. And if you're looking for someone new to follow on Twitter, just look for at Botany Rocks. Now, if you'd like to participate in the Gardener Greetings segment of the show, just send your gardening pictures, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth to Jennifer at thedailygardener.org. That's thedailygardener.org. And here's a reminder that you can listen to the show while you're at home on your smart speaker. Just ask Alexa or Google to play the Daily Gardener podcast, and they will. It's just that easy. Here's today's curated news. Today's article was featured in The Bustle, and it was written by Scarlett James, and it caught my attention because it's called The Seven Best Indoor Herb Gardens. Now, I know we're getting closer and closer to being able to work outside, 
But if you're in a small space and you don't have the ability to garden outside, maybe you're in an apartment or some type of living space where you're just not able to garden, indoor gardens, these growing systems can be a nice option for you to pursue. And they're a great way to elevate herbs into your daily life. Because as Scarlett points out, herbs can often end up half used or forgotten in the back of your refrigerator. Whereas if you have an indoor growing system and it's sitting right there on the kitchen counter, it's hard to ignore the bold, fresh flavor that's growing right at your fingertips. Now, Scarlett does a great job of reviewing these. And she encourages us to take some things into consideration before we go out and buy these self-contained growing systems. Now, the seven that Scarlett selected were evaluated for the amount of light that they offer. She recommends a full-spectrum grow light, which, of course, mimics natural sunshine. Good drainage, because you don't want overwatered or waterlogged herbs. And then finally, look for one that can fit on a tabletop or a windowsill. So if you're in the market for one of these grow systems, check out Scarlett's article. It'll be posted in the Facebook group for the show. And to find it, all you need to do is search for the number seven in the Facebook group for the show. And Scarlett's article will pop right up. And then finally, next up in curated news is a post that I wrote for the blog on the Daily Gardener website, and it's simply called Garden Shopping in the Produce Aisle. Did you know that you can regrow or grow many items from your produce aisle in the supermarket? It's true. In fact, two of the many gardening books that I brought with me to the cabin when I came up here to quarantine were No Waste Kitchen Gardening by Katie Elzer Peters and Don't Throw It, Grow It, the 68 Windowsill Plants from Kitchen Scraps by Deborah Peterson. And those two books are fantastic if you're interested in this topic. And I've put links to them in today's show notes. You know, with seeds being harder and harder to source this year, these kinds of books are a great reminder that we shouldn't be tossing out our kitchen scraps. We can use them to grow more food. And right now, thanks to books like these, I'm growing onion, garlic, spring onions, carrots, and even radish greens, and all of them were started from my food scraps. What's more, I'm discovering that the possibilities for growing from kitchen scraps are really endless. You'd be amazed at all of the options for utilizing pieces and parts of produce from the grocery store to regrow food that you never thought was possible. And what I love about this practice of growing and gardening from produce scraps is that it's a great way to reduce food waste and even help your family to understand the power of gardening and the powerful cycle of growing and harvesting. Botany really is an exciting and wonderful area of science that you can easily study in your own kitchen. All right, that's it for today's gardening news. Now, if you'd like to check out my curated news articles and blog posts for yourself, you're in luck because I share all of it with the listener community in the free Facebook group for the show. Just search for the Daily Gardener Community the next time you're on Facebook and request to join. I'd love to meet you in the group. Here's today's brevities. Today is the birthday of the French priest and botanist Charles Plumier, who was born in Marseille on this day in 1646. Regarded as one of the most important botanical explorers of his time, Plumier served as a botanist to King Louis XIV of France, and he traveled many times to the New World, documenting many plant and animal species. 
In fact, it was during his third expedition to the Greater Antilles that he discovered the fuchsia on the Caribbean island of Hispaniola, which is now Haiti and the Dominican Republic. Plumier named the fuchsia plant after the 16th century German botanist Leonard Fuchs, although we don't call it the fuchsia, we call it the fuchsia. And this particular christening meant that sometimes Charles Plumier is referred to as the father of the fuchsia. Fuchsias are also known as ladies' eardrops. They have that colorful upside-down blossom that hangs down from the stems, and that drooping habit is reflected in many of the common names for fuchsia. The Irish name for fuchsia, Deora Day, means God's tears. Now, the fruit of all the species of fuchsia are edible. Did not know that. But many fuchsia fruits are bland, and they can leave a bad taste in your mouth. But the fuchsia variety Splendens has a flavorful fruit, and it can actually be used to make jam. Plumier made many fantastic discoveries, not just the fuchsia. He also discovered and named both the begonia and the magnolia. Plumier named the begonia after Michael Begon, who was the governor of French Antilles for three years from 1682 to 1685. In fact, it was Begon who got Plumier his job as the plant collector in the Caribbean. He recommended him to King Louis XIV. So that ended up being a nice little thank you back to Begon from Plumier, naming the Begonia. As for the Magnolia, Plumier named that for the botanist Pierre Magnol. Magnol accomplished many things in his work including introducing the concept of plant families. The plant names fuchsia, begonia, and magnolia all first appeared in Plumier's 1703 book called New Plants in the American Genera. Now, Plumier drew the plants and animals that he discovered during his time in the New World, and his drawings were actually quite good. In fact, his illustrations of fish, just fish, were featured in a book by Professor Ted Peach called Charles Plumier and his drawings of French Caribbean fishes. Carl Linnaeus liked Plumier's work as well. He used Plumier's drawings to make wallpaper for his home, something any of us could do during our time stuck at home. Today, Plumier is remembered by the genus Plumeria, a tropical. The Plumeria grows in shrubs and trees, and it's sometimes called by the common name Frangipani. This is because an Italian marquee named Frangipani used Plumeria blossoms to create perfume that was used to scent gloves during the 16th century. And today is the anniversary of the death of an inspiring female Dutch collector, paper artist, illustrator, and horticulturist, Agnes Block, who died on this day in 1704. A Dutch Mennonite, Agnes first married a silk merchant named Hans de Wolf. His income made it possible for Agnes to pursue her many passions. The Dutch poet Joost van den Vondel praised her illustrations and art, while the Dutch artist Jan Venix forever captured the image of Agnes and her second husband, who was also a silk merchant, in their outdoor courtyard at their place called Faverhof. Agnes had purchased Faverhof, which is located just outside Amsterdam, after the death of her first husband. She had married again when she was 45 years old. 
At Faverhof, Agnes collected curiosities, and she installed gardens that were filled with rare and novel plants. Indeed, the many exotic plants and various elements of her garden, like the arbors, became the primary subjects of many pieces of her work. In addition, Agnes commissioned some of the top botanical artists of her time to capture the beauty of the plants and insects at Faverhof. History tells us that Faverhof's gardens were so impressive that they even made royalty jealous. During her lifetime, Agnes was able to experiment and work in an area that was mostly reserved for men. This is why most gardeners today are surprised to learn that it was Agnes Block who successfully grew the first cultivated pineapple in Europe in 1687, thanks to her hothouses. In a nod to her accomplishment, when Jan Venix painted Agnes in her garden, he made sure to include the tropical pineapple. Sadly, Agnes's work was lost to time, but many famous painters captured aspects of her gardens at Faverhof, including the great Maria Sibylla Marian. And today is the birthday of the naturalist William Bartram. He was born on this day in 1739, and he was a fraternal twin with his sister Elizabeth. One of my favorite stories about William Bartram happened in 1775 when he was 36 years old. He left Charleston, South Carolina, on horseback to explore the Cherokee Nation near Franklin, North Carolina. In addition to his many botanical discoveries, Bartram was a student of all aspects of the natural world. And lucky for us, he did quite a bit of writing, and his prose was eloquent, as is evident in this passage about traveling through a terrible storm as he began to make his way up the Jory Mountains. He wrote, It was now afternoon. I approached a charming vale. Darkness gathers around. Far distant thunder rolls over the trembling hills. All around is now still as death. A total inactivity and silence seems to pervade the earth. The birds afraid to utter a chirrup. Nothing heard but the roaring of the approaching hurricane. Now the lofty forests bend low beneath its fury. The face of the earth is obscured by the deluge descending from the firmament, and I am deafened by the din of thunder. The tempestuous scene damps my spirits, and my horse sinks under me at the tremendous peals as I hasten for the plain. I begin to ascend the Jory Mountains, which I at length accomplished and rested on the most elevated peak, from whence I beheld with rapture and astonishment a sublimely awful scene of power and magnificence, a world of mountains piled upon mountains. Ah, love that passage. And today is the anniversary of the death of one of America's greatest garden writers and one of the 20th century's most famous horticulturists, Louise Beebe Wilder, who died on this day in 1938. Louise was born into a wealthy family in Baltimore, and after marrying an architect named Walter Wilder, They bought a country place, a 200-acre estate in Pomona, New York, and they called it Boulder Bray. Louise set about adding fountains, terraces, arbors, walled gardens, and pathways, 
And she wrote a book called My Garden, where she shared all of her experiences learning how to garden at Balder Bray, and where one of her very first flower beds was bordered with clothespins. Very sweet. At Balder Bray, Louise and Walter created both a garden and a stone garden house that was made famous in another one of Louise's books called Color in My Garden, which came out in 1918, already over a hundred years ago, and it's generally regarded as her best work. In the book, Louise became the very first garden writer to write about gray as a garden color. Louise was also the first person to write about moonlight gardens, and she wrote about looking at plants under the light of the moon. It's really lovely if you've ever gone to an evening garden tour. You know what I'm talking about. After World War I, Louise and Walter settled in suburban Bronxville, New York. Louise created a personal Eden for them on a single acre of land that was complete with stone pillars and a long grape arbor. It was here that Louise began rock gardening, something new. In fact, after 1920, most of her garden writing focused on rock gardening. Louise inspired both women and men to rock garden. By 1925, Louise founded a local working gardener's club in Bronxville, and she also had steady work as a garden designer and as a garden writer. Her experiences gave her material for her writing, and she included so many local people from Bronxville in her writing that her columns were often referred to by the locals as a Bronxville family affair. In all, Louise wrote 11 books about gardening. Her voice is pragmatic and pointed, which is why she was so popular. Gardeners appreciated her no-nonsense advice. For instance, Louise was not a fan of double flowers. In her book, The Fragrant Path, from 1932, she wrote... Some flowers are, I'm sure, intended by a wise God to remain single. The hyacinth doubled, for instance, is a fat abomination. Louise wrote for a number of publications, and her writing was published in many prominent periodicals, like the Journal of the Royal Horticultural Society of England and the New York Times. House and Garden alone published close to 150 articles written by Louise, and many of Louise's columns were collected and then published as books. A year before she died, Louise was honored with the gold medal for horticultural achievement from the Garden Club of America. It was the pinnacle moment in her career and it came as Louise and her children were still grieving the loss of her husband. In the spring of 1934, Walter had committed suicide after a long battle with mental illness. Louise wrote prolifically about gardening and plants. Her experiences resulted in increasing the public's awareness of different plant species and gardening practices and Louise helped shape the gardens of her time. And it's not an understatement to say that Louise B.B. Wilder helped shape the gardens of her time. And today we can enjoy the many wonderful quotes that Louise gave us on snowdrops. She said, Theirs is a fragile but hearty celebration in the very teeth of winter. Regarding rosemary, she wrote, It makes a charming pot plant, neat, svelte, with its dark felt-lined leaves held sleek against its sides. The smell is keen and heady. 
resinous, yet sweet, with a hint of nutmeg. As for roses, Louise held them in high esteem. She wrote, Over and over again, I have experienced the quieting influence of the rose scent upon a disturbed state of mind. And when it came to gardening, Louise said, In the garden, every person may be their own artist without apology or explanation. Each within their green enclosure is a creator, and no two shall reach the same conclusion. When I was researching Louise, I discovered that she's buried with her parents in Lot 41 in Lakeside Cemetery in Wakefield, Massachusetts. It was a shock to read that her grave is unmarked and to see that it is completely unadorned without any flowers, nor does it rest under the shade of a tree. And I hope someday that will be remedied. And finally, today is the birthday of the Spanish painter Juan Miro, who was born on this day in 1823. Born in Barcelona, Miro's surrealist art left a mark on the world. Gardeners will especially enjoy his 1918 work called The Vegetable Garden with Donkey and his 1919 work called Vines and Olive Trees. Miro's biography was subtitled I Work Like a Gardener and it captured his thoughts about his art and his work. Miro said, more important than a work of art itself is what it will sow. Art can die. What matters is that it should have sown seeds on the earth. It must give birth to a world. Juan Miro recognized that sculpture was most at home in the natural world. It's no wonder, then, that gardeners love to incorporate sculpture and art into the garden. Regarding sculpture, Miro said, Sculpture must stand in the open air, in the middle of nature. And it was Juan Miro who said, I think of my studio as a vegetable garden, where things follow their natural course. They grow, they ripen, you have to graft, you have to water. I work like a gardener or a wine grower. In Unearthed Words, here are some very true words about this time of year, which can be a mix of hurry up and waiting as the weather evens out. This first one's from Henry Van Dyke, the American author and clergyman. The first day of spring is one thing. The first spring day is another. The difference between them is sometimes as great as a month. Here's a quote from the American novelist and designer Edith Wharton. The early mist had vanished, and the fields lay like a silver shield under the sun. It was one of the days when the glitter of winter shines through a pale haze of spring. Here's a quote from John Burroughs, the American naturalist and writer. A sap run is the sweet goodbye of winter. It is the fruit of the equal marriage of the sun and frost. And here are some thoughts on this crazy time of year from Robert Frost, the American poet, from his 1926 Two Tramps in Mud Time. The sun was warm, but the wind was chill. You know how it is with an April day. 
When the sun is out and the wind is still, you're one month on in the middle of May. But if you so much as dare to speak, a cloud come over the sunlit arch and wind comes off a frozen peak and you're two months back in the middle of March. Here's a one-liner from Mark Twain, the American writer and humorist. In the spring, I have counted 136 different kinds of weather inside of four and 20 hours. And here's some prose from the American author Barbara Holland from her book Endangered Pleasures. Poets and songwriters speak highly of spring as one of the great joys of life in the temperate zone. But in the real world, most of spring is disappointing. We looked forward to it too long, and the spring we had in mind in February was warmer and drier than the actual spring when it finally arrives. We'd expected it to be a whole season, like winter, instead of a handful of separate moments and single afternoons. And finally, here's a little poem from Christina Rossetti, the English poet. I wonder if the sap is stirring yet, if wintry birds are dreaming of a mate. If frozen snowdrops feel as yet the sun and crocus fires are kindling one by one, sing, Robin, sing. I still am sore in doubt concerning spring. It's time to grow that garden library with today's book, Gardening Your Front Yard by Tara Nolan. This book came out in March of this year, and the subtitle is Projects and Ideas for Big and Small Spaces, including vegetable gardening, pollinator plants, rain gardens, and more. The author, Julie Bodden Davis, said, I recommend gardening your front yard to anyone looking to create an eye-catching and inviting front yard. The book promises to inspire non-stop ideas for making your front yard a living masterpiece. This book is 208 pages of ideas and projects, and it's all shared with today's gardener in mind. This is Tara's second book. She also wrote Raised Bed Revolution. And in this new book, we learn about transforming our front yards from wide open lawns and spaces into endless possibilities. Tara's book takes you on a tour of options for repurposing and leveraging the potential of the land that lies between your home sweet home and the sidewalk or the street. Tara shares projects and troubleshooting advice, helping you navigate some of the challenges that you might face as you transform your space. The upshot is that your front yard can go from producing just a single crop of grass to becoming a multi-crop, vital and verdant living space that can greatly enhance your life. You can get a copy of Gardening Your Front Yard by Tara Nolan and support the show using the Amazon link in today's show notes for around $20. Finally, here's something sweet to revive the little botanic spark in your heart. Today is National Pineapple Upside Down Cake Day. We celebrate it every year on the 20th of April. Now, this cake did not become popular in America until after 1903, and the cakes were traditionally made in cast iron skillets, and some people still make them that way. If you've never had it, pineapple upside down cake is a very satisfying dessert 
that you can enjoy with a cup of coffee. If you'd like to make one, line the bottom of a cake pan with pineapple rings and then place a cherry in the center of each ring, followed by a butter and sugar mixture. Finally, the cake batter gets poured over the pineapples and baked. And the best part happens when the cake is done. That's when the pan is turned upside down onto a platter, revealing a masterpiece that is both amazing and delicious. And don't forget that if you use a real pineapple, you can turn the top slice containing the foliage into a very attractive houseplant. Thanks for listening to The Daily Gardener. And remember, for a happy, healthy life, garden every day. During the COVID-19 pandemic, The Daily Gardener is produced in lovely Wyoming, Minnesota. You can find today's show notes over at thedailygardener.org. That's thedailygardener.org. And to participate in the Gardener Greeting segment, send your garden pics, stories, birthday wishes, and so forth to jennifer at thedailygardener.org. And to listen to the show while you're at home, just ask Alexa or Google to play the Daily Gardener podcast. It's that easy. You can find The Daily Gardener on all your favorite social media. And don't forget to share the show with all your garden friends. Finally, I want to thank my fabulous behind-the-scenes team of Brooke, Kiana, and Paige, and my editor, Eric Begay. Have a great day in the garden, and we'll see you tomorrow.